Um, so our guest this morning is Johan de Twee. Uh, he's the CEO of Wink Reports, a company that builds easy to use software uh, to uncomplicate the most complicated tasks, um, specifically related to, you guessed it, reports. Um, and that gives business owners control um, in running their businesses and enables them to start working on their business rather than in their business. That resonates with me. I'm sure it probably resonates with a lot of you as well. Um, so delighted to welcome you here, Johan, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us at Startup Stories this morning. Over to you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, startup Stories. Uh, I took that as a very literal topic, so this is going to be a bit of a meandering story that I'm telling. I'm going to go from the very early days when um, it's uh, not clicking. There we go. Ah. We even practiced it beforehand. <laughs> I could do, I tested my finger and everything. Hey, cool. So, yeah, I'm going to start all the way back when I was like very little. <laughs> um, as you can hear from my accent, I'm from South Africa. I grew up there. I went to university there. I grew up in Pretoria, which is the Jacaranda city. Um, and, you know, I've always been into computers. My first computer that we got in, uh, was a Vic Commodore Vic 20. I don't know if anyone has ever seen those. It's even before the Commodore 64. Um, and I was a little bit older, and that's not actually me in the picture. I was a little bit older than that when we got it, but this thing completely mesmerized me. And um, back then, when you bought a computer, you got a manual with it. And the manual taught you how to program. It had like, here's all the registers. This is how you can put values in there and do stuff. It was like, described the hardware, it described everything, you know, and I... My dad kind of bought the thing, but I was using it most of the time, and I just scoured this whole manual, you know, as a 10 or 11 year old, and kind of taught myself how to, how to code. So I really liked this idea, and you know, coding was part of that. But I really liked the hardware side, you know, that really fascinated me that you can do integrated circuits and stuff and so on. So even while I was at school, you know, I did a lot of electronics classes, uh, buy all the electronics magazines, always. Uh, building little circuits and things. And so I knew from a very young age, I want to be an electronic engineer. And so that's what I did. I went to the University of Pretoria and I studied, studied electronic engineering um, and was very lucky that when I uh, finished, I kind of got a, kind of my dream job almost straight at um, Alcatel, which you know, eventually got bought by Lucent. But back then, you know, they had a big multinational they make all the equipment for like, you know, Telstra and all the different telecommunications companies around the world. And, you know, I specialized in telecoms, got this job, thought it was amazing. Uh, so I started working there and I was very fortunate to almost within the first three months of me working there, I got seconded to go to work in Madrid. Um, now, usually a fresh graduate would not have that kind of opportunity, but this was the beginning days of ADSL, so it was like 1999. And um, just by happenstance, me and the other graduates who started working there, everyone else had either just been there, was about to get married, or there was just like a range of or just had a baby, uh, and they couldn't go. And so they went down the hierarchy, offered for everyone to go to, uh, to, to Spain for a bit, and got down to us and said, um, hey, do you want to go to Spain for a bit? And I'm like, you know, I'm 23. I'm like, yeah, for sure, absolutely. <laughs> um, I had to, like, get a rush passport done. I've never been on an airplane even. You know, it's just, just like a great adventure. So um, we got sent to um, Madrid to basically adapt the ADSL equipment that was just being designed at that point in time and adapt it to, like, uh, South African conditions. And so this is going to be like, they said, one to three months, you know. Three months turned into six months, turned into a year, turned into two years, you know. So first lesson there was things always take a lot longer <laughs> than you think. Um, but also, you know, I, I kind of learned there that, wow, this is it's kind of great to move around a little bit. Um, it's great. It's, it was a lot of fun just kind of going 
somewhere new in Europe, you know, every, every weekend and so on. As part of this, though, I met a bunch of Aussies who was there for the same reason. They were adapting the same equipment for Telstra. So we worked together quite a lot, you know, got to know them. Um, I mean, it was kind of, kind of funny when my bosses from South Africa came to visit, you know, and talk to them. They kind of assumed you're part of their team in South Africa, but, you know, I've worked with them for kind of three, three months, but I've actually worked with the other guys for two years, you know, that's kind of more where it felt was my team. So, so when the project eventually finished, that did finish, okay, eventually, um, the manager of the Australian team said, hey, why don't you come to, have you thought of coming to Australia? Um, I kind of know what you can do. We'll take care of all the visa and all that stuff. And so that's how I ended up in Australia. I came, kind of came, came here by accident, uh, but I haven't, I haven't left since, you know, and I haven't regretted it at all. Now, this is all telecoms engineering, electronic engineering. So, I mean, as I said, that was where my love was. It's funny, though, that life doesn't always work out how you want it, right? I wanted to build integrated circuits, you know, build hardware. But the task that we went to there was just kind of adapt existing hardware, you know? So it was really more firmware changes, you know? So I started working, okay, that's okay. It's close to the hardware. We're programming the chips and so on. Um, that's good. Then when I got to Australia, they said, okay, well, you know this hardware really well. We're not building new hardware. We've just sold this to Telstra, but we need the software build that connects to it if a technician needs to service it, you know, and just the, the monitoring stuff. So I started writing that software because, you know, I can code, you know, I've liked computers my whole life. After that was done, they're like, okay, we need to be able to monitor all of these things in the field with our central monitoring system in the big, in, in uh, the GOC they call in Melbourne, you know, where they monitor the big screens, Telstra, and they check everything. So now I was doing networking, you know, and doing, uh, writing even more abstracted software, big software. And before I knew it, I was a software guy instead of an electronic engineering guy, which turns out was probably a good thing. Um, today, you know, it's so, hardware and making chips and stuff is just not something that's really being done even in the US that much even you know in Australia so uh, you know I'm glad that I ended up in software <laughs> eventually so after I finished uh, with Alcatel um, you know eventually I kind of uh, you know the, the dot com bust happened there's like a bit of a shake up and things I joined uh, a couple of startups you know in a row I first worked at uh, lithium networks which they don't exist anymore, but there was a startup. They were doing uh, video protocoling for, for mobile phones. So again, more software. Uh, then I worked with Tibra when they do derivatives trading. Um, so that was completely removed from telecoms. You know, it's, it's kind of my job where I really made the break and it's not anything to do with engineering telecommunications. But I put that up there because that was a really interesting um, that they're one of the first people in Australia to do the high frequency trading, you know, with exchanges. Um, and because I wasn't a classically trained software engineer, you know, I was electronic engineering. So we learned to do firmware and stuff, but to write really robust, scalable software, it's not really a subject that I had. I didn't do software engineering at university, but there, you know, I learned so much about how to write proper software, how to do the testing, what's the proper patterns and things, how to do things, because we always joked, it's so easy, who's gonna write, do bankruptcy, you know, <laughs> as a function which uh, could lose a million dollars in a trade or something, you know, you don't, you don't wanna be the person responsible for that. So really learned about how do you manage something that needs to be that accurate and work that well, right? I worked there for a few, years and eventually kind of got a bit, it was, it was very hectic, you know, it was a very high pace kind of environment. I thought I'd need a little bit of a scene change and I moved up to uh, Nelson Bay, you know, up to Port Stevens, just a bit of a sea change. Um, started looking for some work and found uh, Promax, which um, I don't know, some of you might know them, they were out in the bay. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, I mean, there's a big, it's a, they're a company that sells enterprise software. They had some really big clients, you know, like Kimberly Clark, Heinz, Johnson & Johnson, all the big 
fast moving consumer goods you would find like when you go to Woolies. Um, but you know, the, the owners, they loved also the lifestyle up in the Bay. So at Taylor's beach in like industrial estate, there was a, an office. Um, so I joined there, they were looking for a development manager. Uh, I've never really been a manager at that point, but I said, sure, why not? I'll say I can do this. Um, and I got hired there, got along really well with uh, John and Scott. Um, and for me, that was interesting. I didn't do much coding there, but I helped when, when I joined there, there were about three or four different developers. By the time I left there, my team had almost 30 developers, you know, so for me, that was a good learning experience, just being involved with another company that kind of went from, you know, a million dollars revenue all the way to, you know, I think it's public knowledge, it's in the paper, like they got acquired for, you know, tens of millions of dollars eventually. And being part of the management team there, you know, I was exposed to not just the development side, you know, we sat in monthly meetings, you know, and I, you know, the, the sales manager got to talk and what, what's the challenges there, you know, the, uh, the, the marketing people, the support people. So you kind of got the whole kind of input and to figure out, hey, this is how you do that. Oh, this is how these pieces fit together. And, you know, you also got to learn how to do stuff like, you know, hiring people, you know, firing people, you know, it's not fun, but you know, it's something, a skill that you gotta, gotta learn eventually. So ended up there. Um, as I mentioned, they eventually got acquired by Wipro in uh, India. Um, one of the people I hired while working there was Gavin, my prospective co-founder. Um, and so when they got acquired, I think Gavin and I both thought, look, I think we've done here what we can do in terms of, you know, they're bringing in new management from overseas. You know, we, you, you can't have as much impact uh, as you want. And that's kind of something that we wanted to do. So we decided, uh, let's take a little break. I think Gavin went on a Europe, Europe trip for a while. Um, but when he got back, we said, let's try and create a startup. And that was literally around the time when the Lean Startup book came out. And it was all about running Lean. And we sat in Gavin's living room and filled out hundreds of Lean canvases, you know, and <laughs> went through the whole thing. Um, we kind of got involved in two startups that kind of one after the other had a little bit of traction. The first was uh, Skill Flip. So this was kind of a website trying to connect people teaching things, anything, and students. Um, and it turns out it's kind of a good idea. Like there's actually an American company called Skillshare, which started at the same time as well. And they like huge now, you know, that well. Um, and also we were co-founders at Switched In, uh, but also, you know, this was kind of solar and, you know, renewable energy and things, but, you know, I'll get to why we kind of left both of these businesses eventually. Part of it was, you know, we were trying to hustle, you know, we were doing a lean canvas and said, I think there's a gap here in the market, we can do this, this will be our advantage. But, you know, trying to start a new business is hard, right? Um, like, you know, for Switched In, for instance, it was a, it was a very long-term play, you know? Um, and I know they do really well. Probably a bunch of you guys know people there. Um, but at that early stage, you know, we kind of had to leave because we were like, uh, you know, we, I just had a baby. <laughs> I had to pay the rent and that kind of thing. And, for instance, the skills... Uh, skill flip one was interesting. We were trying to kind of bootstrap it, you know, like, cause it's a two-sided marketplace, which is notoriously hard to, to do. So we said, look, we'll do the first few lessons and kind of get people to do it. So we did some growth hacks, you know, said, okay, let's do it ourselves, right? So the first, I have some chef friends. I have a, you know, a pastry chef person as well. And so kind of convinced him, how about we do uh, cake decorating classes? Uh, we had to go hire a big commercial kitchen where you could, um, you, can, you know, where you can, um, if I go back to the slide, you know, with enough space, this is one of the lessons we did and a photo shoot we did, uh, you know, I had to hire this, but you can't hire a commercial kitchen unless you're a food safety supervisor. So I went and did training and I became a food safety supervisor, you know, and we know, I know, we know everything about commercial kitchens now, you know, we, I know what the, oh, 
it's a combi oven and the, you know, the, <laughs> everything works. So, you know, I remember trying to cut costs. So we tried to leverage, I, I, I called up one of the, um, the old Promax people we used to work with. One of their clients was, a, um, was General Mills, you know, that make flour. So I said, oh, if we can get some of the costs donated and just as promotion for them, then, you know, we can uh, uh, save some costs here, you know, because we're, we're kind of running these things. We're also running Groupon to kind of promote the, the thing and to get people to buy these um, classes at a discount, but we were just kind of breaking even on it. And, you know, I think that getting the flower for free was a kind of a win in some ways, but it was also a little bit of a wake up call for us because when they said, yes, where's your loading dock, you know? <laughs> and we had to get the big truck, pull up and deliver a pallet of flour in our garage. We were like, okay, hang on, what are we doing here, <laughs> right? How did I come from being a software engineer and uh, you know, doing, trying to build electronics to, this is not what we wanna do. We're not wanna drive down to Sydney and check out um, you know, kitchens and take deliveries of flour and so on. So, you know, it's a bit of a, let's reevaluate our life choices. I mean, switching was a bit the same as well. Like, I, we don't know anything about renewables and the energy market and any of this stuff, you know, it's just not a good fit. So it kind of came back to, hey, let's go back to this lean canvas. You know, it's got the little tiny box. It's not actually even a huge box where they talk about the unfair advantage. And we were always like, what unfair advantage does the product have, you know, and all these ideas, rather than thinking like, well, we're the unfair advantage. What do we have? What do we know that can help us build a business? And so let's take stock of what we can do, what we know, which is, you know, I mean, it's, it's a crazy idea, right, to go with what you know. <laughs> um, and so because we've worked at Promax and, you know, we've seen – We've worked intimately with these large businesses. We understand how inventory management works. We've done large, huge databases and syncing and reporting of this and analytics and knew that data was kind of the answer in this kind of industry, this niche industry. We said, okay, let's, let's do something around that, you know? And that's how our, um, you know, Wink reports got, got born. Um, so, a little bit of a history lesson just um, over time, you know, like when I was you know, young in the 80s and 90s, it was all about spreadsheets, you know, when new computers came out, Lotus and um, what was the other one? Oh, I can't even remember, but there's like a few. Uh, and then when Excel came out, um, it's <laughs> actually I saw a video the other day of a Microsoft Excel ad from the 1992 or something. And it's a guy in an elevator quickly building a little <laughs> spreadsheet and it's like, oh, look at this. I can drag, you know, you can drag the values out and it will autocomplete, you know, and then everyone else in the elevator is like, ooh, my spreadsheet doesn't do that. So <laughs> it was, um, but you know, that was the thing, you know, like, but, but your data was on your laptop, right? And so then through the nineties, you know, like servers and things became uh, more useful and a lot of big companies could afford that. And it's the, it's the age of the ERP, you know, so you get one big giant, piece of software that does everything. It does your accounting, your inventory, your HR, everything. And then there was this movement in the 2000s. Um, and this is around the time when we started. It re it's really when zero. Zero was about five years old. Um, they were convincing. There was a lot of big players in the market trying to convince people, no, no, it's the cloud. You know, you've got to move everything into the cloud. Um, and so we said, look, with our knowledge of data and data ma uh, management, we think there's something to do here. If we can get this data into a central spot, you know, we can do something with that. We're not sure exactly what it was yet, um, but we started a company called Silver Lining, which is kind of, and we were building this data platform that just pulled from, from zero and a couple of other places, just data into our single database. And, and Silver Lining, because every cloud has a silver lining. That was the idea, right? So, uh, I just became a dad at that point. So that's my dad jokiness was developing, you know? So, you know, we've told clients to move this way, but they kind of want to still do stuff. 
this way and have control, you know? So a little bit in wink, you know, when I, I, I talk to clients all the time and I usually ask them, would you run your whole business from spreadsheets? And, you know, the answer is always no, right? But you've told us, let's, you use HubSpot for your sales, you use zero for your accounting, as we said. But if you ask them, have you used the spreadsheet at all in the last month? And the answer is always yes, you know? And how do they get that data into the spreadsheet where they can do, make their business decisions? Well, they do it by hand. You know, people are exporting things every day or every week or some poor admin person has to do it and they copy and paste it. Um, and people spend a lot of time on that. And, you know, it's a manual process. Um, something that people don't um, always uh, realize as well as it's a lot of errors. Most spreadsheets contain errors from some research. And uh, there's an example here of JP Morgan lost a lot of money, a few billion bucks, six billion dollars, when they did a copy and paste. One of the analysts did a copy and paste and uh, there was a sign, it was a minus instead of a plus or something in some column. And they only later realized, oh, okay, we've actually um, calculated our revenue wrong or something. Um, and then, you know, after you've done all of this and you're showing the spreadsheet and your charge and emailing out to people, it's probably already out of date as well, right? So we said, look, there's opportunities around this. I and mean, that's kind of a summary of our canvas, you know, what we're thinking. And so we said, look, let's do a, um, let's build something around that. But we've learned our mistakes from all the other things. We like to get paid. So let's find a paying customer from day one, um, let's not pretend we know already what they're gonna, what they want. Let's find someone who has a real pain point and you know, let's get paid to figure out what their problem is and give them a solution. But keep in mind that we wanna build a product at the end of the day. We don't wanna be a consulting firm, but you know, it's really hard from day one to build an enterprise solution that will be you know, ready to use you got to start somewhere. So let's start with the biggest pain points. Now, we didn't know exactly what it was, but we were very lucky to find a, um, a client or a couple of clients who had a very painful problem. And like I said, we were silver lining in the beginning, but it soon turned out like the solution for a lot of the stuff is reports for people. So we eventually renamed the company to be um, uh, Wink Reports. But yeah, we found people who had pain points around this, how much time they spent, that they were willing to, you know, pay ten, fifteen thousand dollars to get it fixed, you know. And so for us, that was like, oh great, okay, we can, we might not be living like kings, but getting one person to pay means if you can build a product out of it, you can get probably more people to pay. And if you can do that and you can get it repeatable, then suddenly you have a business. Um, yeah, so that's like, it gives us the confidence to it. Um, and interestingly, our first client, uh, Gem uh, Gosford Electrical Manufacturing, uh, they were the, our first client to help us build stuff. And uh, they're still with us today, you know? So it shows like, I'll show a little bit of the, how the software has developed over time, but it's um, kind of interesting that, you know, we didn't outgrow them as such, uh, then, and they're still getting what they need out of the software. So once we decided kind of reporting, we've said, yes, we want this experience that people want. You know, they want to be like Google Sheets or Spreadsheets or, you know, the newer kids on the block, Monday and uh, Airtable. It's all kind of the same thing. People want this experience. That's why they're so popular. But their data is stuck over there. They want to use the data that is in their inventory system and their accounting system. Uh, Okay, and so we've built this system. Um, we make it, you know, automated, it's like one click. Uh, it's uh, always up to date and hopefully it's always accurate. Um, now, how do you get to that? Well, like I said, it's hard. You can't just build the final solution. It will take like, you know, we've been going for about seven years. So it's take a long time to get something. So. This is our first version, you know, we had the data importing, that wasn't too bad, but, you know, if you look under the hood, it was a bit, 
<laughs> it was very manual, you know, like we kind of exported things and just threw it in a database. And then our, we didn't even have our own front end. I don't think we did. So Gavin wrote a big chunk of this. He wrote the, this is Google Sheets. So we, our first MVP was just an add-on, a plugin, JavaScript plugin into this. And so you would run, select the filters and it would run this and just, it would draw, fill in these cells one by one. So you click run and you have to wait and it would do a query to our API and just kind of put this stuff in the right spot. Um, now there was a, you know, a class or a function on our site that knew how to do this kind of rendering. And I'll get back to that. But eventually we could replace that. We could, uh, I think I wrote it in like a week <laughs> or, or something. Eventually we changed, when we got a few more clients, we changed it to, instead of render to, to Google Sheets, we rendered it to our own website. You can see it was all kind of silver lining still at that point. But this is exactly the same report as the other one. And it's for the same clients, that first client. This report still runs today. It looks a lot different, but essentially it's the same thing. Now, how did we build this out? So this is gonna be a little bit more technical, but you know, for the people who like that stuff, it's kind of, I think it serves an illustration how we're trying to get to be it for enterprise all the way from where we had nothing, a spreadsheet. So, you know, in the beginning, we, the first thing we built was the database schema. So the front end didn't matter, but it's just how do we store the data? So we had uh, a database schema, but everything was very custom written. You know, we, we were using Python and the, the report class was, everything was just custom written to say, you know, literally iterate over this and put it, <laughs> you know, in these, these slots. So then we figured out, okay, we've got a few clients or the same client had a few reports. I can't remember exactly. We said, okay, we're seeing now there's like a pattern in the custom classes that we're writing. Let's make a standard class. They have standard functions, you know, they can use a little bit of inheritance, um, but we can still kind of control what they do by certain attributes. So you still have to commit a new, you have to create a new class for each report, but you could say the title is gonna be this and the, you know, the, the query is this query and you know, the columns are gonna be this and change the color to this. So it's like a configuration, but for each new thing, you had to still you know, write code, you had to commit it, you had to deploy it onto the server. So then the next step after that was we were like, okay, we're not seeing any more new attributes that we need to add. We kind of cover most use cases. So let's now break out one of these reports and say, this is a dynamic report. So it's just that class, but we can feed it a JSON file, something that's just the configuration and it will populate those attributes based on what's seen in this. So now we don't have to um, code any more classes when the client needs a new report, but we just had a little window where we could manually edit the JSON and, and, and put it in. And so very close now, we're like, okay, this, the configuration is standard, but it's, um, let's, let's now just allow the user to create this configuration himself. And so that's when we built a designer into the thing and you can preview how things run. But you know you can now you know if you add a column, it adds the right stuff in the configuration. If you change the data source, it just changes that. And suddenly we have a product, you know, where people could use it yourself. So it was a long path to get there. You know, it was a very manual process, uh, one client at a time. You know, we had to really put a lot of time and effort in in each one. But as soon as we built the designer, suddenly you know people could sign up. We had people sign up, start using the system, and we never spoke to them. You know, it was like a revelation. It was amazing. Um, so, you know, now it's, uh, you know, just money all the way, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is what it looks like today. Um, it's gonna, you know, you can connect. You just click one button. It sets it all up. It sets up some standard reports for you, some dashboards. But you can go and edit things. You can change formulas. You can, we've got our own formula engine that we coded that can uh, that works very much like Excel. Uh, we can do more things now. We've got modules that's on there. You can do automations. So a bit like Zapier and things where based on this, of course we have this data. You can say if certain conditions are met, 
then just go do stuff, go update things, email someone, um, you know. Uh, we've also got planning module now where you can, people can put in their budgets and things just straight into the product rather than having to keep it somewhere else. So this is kind of stuff that, you know, we knew how to do this stuff coming from Promax because it was all about it was a forecasting and a budgeting tool that they had, you know. So again, drawing a lot of that knowledge. And now you can see, I mean, our reports can get quite complex now. You know, you can move and things around. It's, we're using React now for the front end, so it's a lot more interactive and you can roll things up. So yeah, that's kind of how we got where we're at. Um, we've got about 300 and actually 380 since this morning. You know, it's about a 10 since last, new ones since last week when uh, I, I created this clients. And they're, they're all across the world. Some are even bigger places that you might've heard of, you know, like when Raspberry Pi signed up, we were, I was very excited, you know, because of my hardware, you know, fetish, <laughs> so to speak. Um, huh? No, no, but I mean, it's quite interesting, you know, like they're, we I mean, you can see like when it's, 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 the, it's the head office in the UK using it, you know, and they hooked up their inventory system. So you can see like when they're sending out reports every morning, like email to their salespeople to say like, how many units are we shipping to Sony this month, you know, and things. It's like millions and millions. So um, yeah, and you know, there's some uh, Campus & Co is kind of a chain of um, little supermarkets like 7-Elevens in the UK. Uh, SBD, they do weightlifting equipment. They, once you start seeing your clients on TV, you know, you might not know them when they sign up, but then I'm watching like World's Strongest Man, you know, competition on ESPN or something. And suddenly you see the SBD logo, it's like everywhere. And like, oh my goodness, you know, that, that, that's our guys, you know. Or even Nutworks, you know, I haven't heard from them, but, you know, Aldi was selling all these nut bars and things, whatever. And when I look closer, it's like, oh, it's Nutworks, you know, so we help them solve some problems, you know, around there. So, so we've got about 400, half a million report views and chart views and stuff every month now. Uh, we've grown to eight employees, uh, full-time employees in Australia, and we connect to about 30 different things. So thanks guys, that was, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for that. Um, all right, so we've got some questions. Um, okay, so I'm actually going to start from the bottom because I think they're a little bit more interesting. So <laughs> <laughs> only because um, oh, they relate the to some I of the haven't seen yet, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. Uh, so these are challenge-related questions that were asked at registration. So the first one's from Rowan Thomas from the University of Newcastle is asking, what were the mistakes you made during your journey and what would you do differently? Yeah, I mean, that's a interesting question and in that it assumes that mistakes can be avoided right um it's i wouldn't call anything we've done a mistake you know and there's some things that i think i would we would do a little bit different i think um uh, we wouldn't do some of those other startups <laughs> that we tried before um but i think in this final one there's not huge mistakes that I can think of um, because we had all those other mistakes before, you know? So mistakes in the past were, you know, trying to build it and they'll come, you know, that kind of idea, you know, and not having, not finding someone with the real problem as your first order of business rather than, I mean, as a technical guy, it's so easy to get into your safe place of just, I want to go code something, you know, I want to build something without knowing that, oh yeah, I have one, two, three people lined up who are breaking down your door for a solution. If you don't have that, I think uh, maybe evaluate where you're at, to be honest. So I think that would be the thing, but you know, I think, I do think all, all our mistakes shape us as well to be able to do what you can do now. Like I don't think all the, meandering I've done through my life. I don't think, uh, looking back, each one taught me a little bit of something that we can use now. And I always find it interesting that they say a lot of successful founders are in their forties. So, um, but they're not, you know, they don't make the news that often, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like, I think there's, there's some truth to that. Like you, I think you, you, you might have to, um, 
struggle a little bit, you know, at, at times or to, to go through that, to really come out the other side. You know? And I think um, kind of correlated to that is luck and what role it plays, particularly with those 18 to 21 year olds, right, who happen to make it big. Yeah. Even uh, later stage founders or older founders, um, you know, it's the 18 year olds that are the major outliers there and how much luck contributes to that um, and how much luck just contributes generally, yeah. like right time, right place, right skill set, right founders, right problem. Like a, a lot of yeah. stuff has to line up, right, to make it work. It's like I said, I think skill flip was a good idea. It's proven there's a, there's a unicorn company out there that does exactly how we envisioned it, but it wasn't within our skill set. We went in the right time, right place, right people to execute on that. So you don't really have much control about it, except you can fail fast. You know, once you see the pallet in your garage, you should make the call. You shouldn't say like, oh, I'm so invested now, let's continue. You should be able to make that call um, to, to not do it. And it, it's, it's hard. I mean, like switched in, for instance, that they're really successful now as well. But at that point, we had some short term goals as well, which, you know, you've got to decide where, where are your strengths? Can you contribute to it? And I think, you know, again, you've got to decide I'm not the right person for this. I want to focus on, you know, my competitive advantage. But it takes time to learn what your competitive exactly, advantage is. Exactly, right? Yeah. It's, and it's kind of, I'm like, listening to you talk, thinking how disciplined you need to be or what, what is it about you innately that you have to have to be able to recognise that it's time to stop? Like, it's, it's, is it a gut feeling? Is it? It is a little bit and it's very hard because you're invested, you can't see it. But I think having a co-founder was instrumental in this, you know, in that you can say, am I crazy? Are we doing the right thing? And they can say yes, this is not working. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, and, and definitely luck. I mean, I don't want to dismiss the 18 year olds who do it because some of them are amazing oh, business yeah. people, you know, phenomenal. Um, but yeah, luck plays a role and it plays for us as well. We've had quite a few lucky moments, you know, there were times when it could have gone either way. And I mean, we're growing, but we're not, we're not a unicorn by <laughs> any, any, stretch of the imagination. So we're still looking out for luck, you know, if anyone's got some good, <laughs> good uh, opportunities, send them our way. Um, the next question we've got from Peter Morrissey from HunterNet Cooperative, and he's asking, what was the problem that you started with that led to your solution through Wink Reports? So I think we've pretty much got that covered in the presentation, but you kind of touched on specifically with, you started off with silver linings. What was the, if we look at that example from you transitioning from silver linings to wink reports, what was that problem that you started that, that made the decision to go from one yeah. company to another? So as I was saying, we, 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 we built basically a, a database, you know, like to kind of do things. We, we, we weren't sure whether it's going to be people want to move data around or um, uh, I don't know what, what they want to do with it. But we were lucky enough to um, meet up with someone who was a, a, a consultant, you know, and he had a few businesses. And we met him at, uh, you know, some meetups here in, in, in Newey. I think the Lunatic Society or something was still going and there was some morning breakfast. Um, and he had a couple of clients and we just had a chat. And he said, look, I think I have someone who has a real problem. And it was exactly that problem about the how do we, they don't, they don't know how to pull this stuff out of zero and get it into the format that they needed, mm -hmm. you know, because they were storing things in a way, in a certain way, but they needed to know like per job, how is things tracking, you know? And so it was, uh, they were literally spending, you know, like um, hours a day on this. And, and then they were still having trouble, you yeah. know, it's, it wasn't a complete solution. So very quickly we saw, oh, okay, our first two clients, wanted us to build spreadsheets kind of for them that's automated. So we said, okay, it sounds like reporting. Let's, let's focus on that. Uh, let's just kind of lean into it. And, and so, yeah, that's kind of the problem that we saw was that how do I get the data that's in the cloud systems into a format that they need to run their business? I mean, we don't do financial reporting that much. You know, we don't do the reporting that your accountant wants. Mm -hmm. We do the reporting that people use every day to decide John is going to be doing this and Sue is going to be doing this and we need to order more of that, you know, like the really 
business decision type. type well, you'd hope zero would be good enough that it's delivering some good financial reports, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, and there's, there's a lot of competition in that field, yeah. so we don't even even try to. But when we do sales sales calls, you know, we just treat the client usually. When they contact us, we just say, okay, you're already a client because you found us. I'm sure there's a problem we can solve. So we get them, get them on a Zoom call as soon as we can and say, bring us that one spreadsheet, you know, mm -hmm. and they know exactly what you mean, you know, and they say, and you bring that to the thing and we can just show them quickly, okay, we can do the whole thing, even in half an hour call sometimes, or kind of get a, lo a long way there so they can see the potential that, oh, wow, this is going to free up my time. Uh, then it's an easy sell at that point. That's a really kind of good segue to a question by Kieran James from Direct Business Hub, who's asked, how do you help businesses which don't really understand data and how it works? And how do you help them find their blind spots? So they might come to you to say, this is what I'm trying to find. How often is it that it's like, no, actually, you need to step back. There's a whole other um, yeah. like process here. And also, not only can we help you figure out that problem, but also these other problems as well, or that you know answer these issues. That yeah, you've got. I mean that's a, that that is that happens all the time. Mm. We've got to be careful though. We we are trying. I mean, we're trying to be a SaaS product, not a consultancy okay. service, right? Um, that said, we do focus on some very specific verticals, right? So I've mentioned the inventory businesses. So we have retailers, manufacturers, wholesalers. But we also connect to all the job management tools that tradies use, you know, so uh, plumbers, electricians, all those guys. So we focus only on those. And so we know those businesses really, really well, right? And so our support staff, our customer success people, they also know, they know everything about plumbing, <laughs> you know, pretty much, or, or what's involved in that type of a business, or what's the typical things that um, uh, uh, inventory business um, has to solve. So, so clients don't come to us with problems like, how do I change the color of this chart or whatever? They come to us and say, oh, we just launched a new product and we're selling it as part of a gift basket but also separately. And I can't figure out how many I've sold and when do I need to reorder because this is now appearing as two different SKUs and it's kind of confusing and the, the inventory system can't tell you, which is amazing. Uh, so, you know, we have that domain knowledge and because we just keep focusing on these niches, all our staff kind of keeps having that same domain knowledge. So, you know, we get very technical clients who we've worked with and, you know, they say, oh, I have this problem and I need to solve it this way. Can you just help me build this report? And then we do. Yeah. But then we get clients come in and, you know, they don't, they know nothing. You know, they, they just say like, I feel out of control but I, I need something, um, then we can draw on and say, you know what? I know another business who had a similar problem. This is a nice thing, having almost 400 clients now. We've seen almost everything. Mm. So we can draw on that knowledge and say, look, we're not a consultant. This is not financial advice or business advice, but we had a client with a similar problem or we've already built a tool because this happens so often that you can track your forecasting levels or whatever you need to yeah. do, you know. So it's it's more of a, we just get the experience in it and then you can, it's kind of a snowball effect. The more experience you get, yeah. the more useful you can be if you specialize like yes. this, you know. So if we now go into a different vertical, it might not be the same. Yeah. The, just quickly, the other thing is we, we have found, like a lot of the tradies, especially, they have, a lot of them, if they're still growing and they're small, they're new business owners, they have business coaches. And so a lot of them have gone back to their business coach, showing them some of the dashboards and things that we've brought. And so then the, they came back to us, the coach, and said, oh, this is great. I'm trying to teach these guys about tracking this, this, and this. This is the KPIs. Can you build a special dashboard for all my students or clients or whatever? So we've done a bit of that where a bit of the advisory side of it mm. is now we're working with some mm. coaches or advisory firms where they can provide that bit, but using Wink yeah, okay. uh, to get that message there. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I, I've got a technical related question here from yeah. James Sneddon at Prep Health who's asking, how do you build a technical team yeah. and who should be the first hire and how do you qualify them? I'm going to assume you're talking about a tech SaaS. Yes. Um, 
I mean, it's really hard for me to say how does a non-technical person hire a technical person because I'm very technical myself. And when Gavin and I just built everything in the beginning you know, ourselves. Um, that said, you know, I've hired uh, a lot of people, um, you know, previously as well in, in, in jobs. Um, you know, we, our process, we usually have a little task that we have that, you know, won't take people an hour or anything, but just to show that someone knows what, um, what, the, what they're about. Um, and we have a way that we, for each different role, for instance, we have um, different criteria. You know, we, we, we this is a, I can't remember the guy's name. He wrote, he's from um, HubSpot. He was their sales um, VP originally. And he, he was saying how they're hiring salespeople. We kind of adapted that to technical people where you say all the attributes, I want someone who, you know, can, um, you know, so, let's say intelligence or um, uh, uh, like soft skills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like um, how organized they are, you know, or um, you can kind of say put all these things that you think would make a good programmer mm. and weigh them in different ways. Mm. So, maybe a junior dev doesn't need to be as good on certain things. They didn't need to be, uh, they didn't need leadership qualities as much. But for a senior dev, you might have leadership qualities. And so our, our interview is very structured. So we have literally a question that kind of gauges each one of these points. You know, we kind of go through it naturally, mm -hmm. but you know, go, okay, here's a question that's gonna really be asking to see whether you have team leading abilities or ambition, or whether you, you know, and, and so we kind of give them a score for each one of this. And then we, you know, we literally compare the scores at the end and be you've got to be diligent and decide we're going to trust the score not our gut feeling on this because yeah. that's what you decided yeah, beforehand yeah. i do think though if you're going to be if you want to be build a SaaS, a tech startup i might have said some people but if you're not a little bit techy i, I don't think maybe you should look at a different kind of startup you know like maybe more a uh, food tech or something or something yeah. that you got experience in because mm. um, it, it, it's hard and if you don't know what you know you're if, if you're trying to get a you know if you're getting try, hiring a co-founder it's like getting married you know yeah. you gotta <laughs> really trust that person and uh, yeah I, I, you read a lot of stories on the forums and things where it goes south you know uh, but I'm a big believer in you can master a lot of things pretty quickly like before we hired a success person, you know, I did the success role myself for six months. You know, before we hire a marketing person, you know, I try and do a little bit of that. Not become an expert, but that I know enough to be dangerous and then know like, okay, we need to get a real person in, but I can have that conversation about that, you know. So if you're a non if you're a non-technical founder, I'm not saying learn how to code, but you've got to know what technologies are out there. You know, mm. what is possible? What can the different things do? Because then you can have that conversation and more easily with someone. Yeah. Final question, because right. we're running out of time, um, is reflecting on, oh, this is from, sorry, Fiona Lan. Reflecting on your startup journey, what's the best advice you can offer to other startup founders? So I think this was in the newspaper article yesterday <laughs> as well. Um, I think... Cash flow is so important, especially if you're bootstrapping. And at the moment, getting investment funds is kind of hard as well. Uh, I think just trying to be cash flow positive from day one, or at least get someone to put money down on an idea so you can say like, look, we, we might not be able to live off this, but if I get 500 of these people paying this, then it will be. Um, so just so that you, you're smart you know, with your money. Um, like we, we've bootstrapped for seven years, you know, we're only getting investments now. Um, and so, you know, everything takes twice as long as you think and everything costs twice as much as you budgeted. budgeted. So just um, having some sort of cash flow coming in is, is, I think, very important. Yeah. Great advice, especially if you're bootstrapping. Johan, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us today. Thanks everyone. So we've just got a couple of final messages. Um, oh, if I can just grab that from you, Go thanks so it. much. So, um, oh, 
Where am I? Oh, so our next Join the Dots, which is our monthly networking event. It's on the last Thursday of every month. So at the end of, can you believe we're in June already? But at the end of June on the 30th, we've got Join the Dots with the New Movers. So the New Move Initiative is an initiative of the City of Newcastle where they basically subsidise people to relocate from elsewhere in Australia and the world to Newcastle. So these are people with specific technical expertise or entrepreneurs, um, business innovators. Um, and so you'll have the opportunity to meet half a dozen of the 30 uh, new movers that have relocated to, to Newcastle over the last 12 months. Um, and then we've got startup stories with Liz Kavanagh. She's one of our female founder program participants last year. Um, she's got a really interesting business called Creative Sensory Spaces. So she's going to be talking about her startup journey. Um, uh, we have the incubator. So co-working is back um, now that COVID um, oh, I won't say it's behind us, but you know, we're living with COVID, but we can co-work again, once again. So if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about our uh, plans for co-working, uh, or if you'd like to um, check out the space, we have some new images actually with some models that are in the room uh, on our website, or you can check out the space after today's event. We're happy to take you through, um, but it's at uh, newcastle.edu.au slash incubator for more information on that. And that's it. So thank you all so much for coming along. Uh, feel free to stick around and have a chat, but also conscious that uh, it's nine o'clock, so you might have a job to do um, or a car that needs to be moved. So um, otherwise, we're happy to uh, stick around and have a chat with you. But thanks so much for coming along. Really appreciate it. And thanks again, Johan.